So thank you to Raina and Matt and John um, for organizing this and inviting me. Um, so how is the sound level? Okay, I just didn't know if we haven't talked with microphones very much and in the normal, the other mics, I was really loud at first. <laughs> um, okay, so just to start <laughs> with some background, right? So this is famous drawing from Ramoni Cajal. So as early as 1900, right, we knew that neurons were these individual cells that were interconnected in networks. Um, and he actually got the Nobel Prize in 1906, shared with Golgi, who was responsible for the stain that allowed him to sort of selectively see these neurons. Interestingly, apparently they spent their whole Nobel Prize speeches sort of fighting with each other um, because Golgi did not believe in this um, neural network model. Um, but so the big takeaway now is Right, we can extrapolate to this network model with connectivity. Um, and so what is that model really going to consist of? So first, we're going to assign variables to each of our neurons right, that need to capture some characteristic of their firing. In our case, we're going to focus on the firing rate. Um, in other areas of the brain, right, that might not be the information carrying mechanism, um, but for our concerns, we're going to focus on that. And then to each of our edges or our synapses, we're going to assign a weight or a connection strength. And this is just backwards from what you might typically think, but is standard in neuroscience, that WIJ is actually the strength from neuron J to neuron I. Um, and then the last ingredient is going to be these external drives. So we're thinking within a single layer. Um, of a given network, right? But from outside layers, there's inputs coming into these neurons. So connection strength is a proxy for sort of number of contact points maybe of your synapse or some sort of measure of how strong the synaptic connection is or how strong the influence of in this case, neuron X3 is on neuron X4. You can think of it as a weighted graph, easily. Um, yeah? Right. Right. So you can, in fact, think of this as a directed graph, but with weights along the edges, right? And so the weight is telling you, like, so a Larger W43 than W32, for example, means that X3 has a stronger impact on the firing of X4 than X2 does on X3. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now we have ingredients, right? But we still need some system of dynamics that's going to tell us really how all of these things interact and update each other. And so one possible set of <laughs> dynamics we might consider is a linear system of differential equations. Okay, so we'd have um, that the change in the firing rate for a variable i, right, or node i, is we get this leak term or this decay constant so that um, in the absence of other inputs, the neuron's firing rate would decay to zero. Yeah? Sorry, I didn't know this one question for you. Oh, that's okay, go back. <laughs> yes, I didn't have good enough wait time also. Ah, no. So there can be bidirectional synapses, but there need not be. Right? So there, in this case, um, right. So I am sort of implicitly assuming that neuron 3 synapses onto neuron 4, but there is no backwards direction. Right? So this would be important, for example, if you wanted, to, if you were learning a sequential memory, right, and you needed to remember that this thing always comes after this other thing, right? You wouldn't want them exciting each other in both directions because you'd lose that directionality in that sequence. Okay. Do you have, you look like you're ready to ask another question. Yeah, so biologically the idea is Think, for example, that we're living in V1, 
with this network, right? These are inputs from a previous layer. Okay. Okay. So now we want to somehow add some dynamics to this system, right? And so maybe your first straightforward guess is hit it with a linear system of differential equations, right? So this negative xi, as I was saying, um, guarantees that in the absence of inputs, the firing rate decays to zero. Because I have set the time scale to be one. But all of this would work if I had changed, so I could have a tau on all of this and have an arbitrary time scale. Yep, good question. Um, and then otherwise I'd take a sum of synaptic inputs to that neuron, right, and then add on my external drive. Okay. So this seems straightforward enough and probably maybe a simplest explanation we might use, but what does it really give us, right? So if we had a linear system like this, right, what kinds of dynamics could we get? Um, so one thing we could do is we could solve for the fixed point, right? So in other words, when that derivative is zero, so we're at this steady state, and we can solve for the value of x, and assuming that i minus w is invertible, right, we're getting a single value for this fixed point, right? There is one fixed point and only one fixed point. And then back to sort of differential equations 101, right, you can classify characteristics of that fixed point. Is it stable? Is it unstable? So perturbations around it would take you in there, perturbations around it would take you away, and there's different types of stability and lack of stability, right? Or we could get, if we had purely imaginary eigenvalues, we could also get these unstable periodic orbits, okay? So now, this is when we're really going to say, okay, is this model actually enough, right? Are these the only behaviors that we want to be able to see, right? Biologically, what do we really need? And so again, remember, we get one and only one fixed point and one dynamic behavior per linear system. So going back to biological motivation, um, we're going to consider here hippocampus. Um, so my collaborator and I have been working some with a um, researcher at Genelia who studies hippocampus, and so that's been my primary focus. Um, so functions there include associative memory. So the idea that you have unrelated items, but now they have relations between them that you need to learn, right? Or sequential memory. So the idea like you're memorizing a phone number and you need to keep track of the order in which those digits appear. Um, it's also responsible for tracking the animal's position in space. I'm not gonna talk so much about that, but um, maybe Chad will mention. Yeah, okay, so Chad's talk will have some aspects of that. Um, so what do we need in order to model these phenomena? So typically, associative memory has been modeled with um, sets of stable fixed points. So the idea is, um, and each fixed point consists of a different collection of active neurons, right? So the idea is maybe the neurons for these features correspond to one memory, right? A different association involves these neurons that are coding for some specific set of features that are, you've now learned a relationship between, and then we could have another one, right? And so we want all of these things to be stable fixed points because the idea is if initially I um, have activated these two neurons, right? then I want the network to evolve and eventually take me to, like pattern complete, to my full memory, okay? And then stay at that memory in time. So that's the idea behind why we would want to model these with stable fixed points so that we could maintain that activity, but also so that we could get there even if we didn't initially activate all of the neurons that were related. <coughs> The other important function, right, is sequential memory. Um, so suppose you're Tommy Two-Tone and you want to remember Jenny's phone number, 8675309, <laughs> and you have to keep saying it over and over in your head, 
right, in order to encode this memory initially. And so here is an example of how one could do that, and that's typically modeled with limit cycles of sequential activity, okay? Um, and so here, just to, because these types of pictures are going to come up a lot, let me just talk you through it, right? So there's a different color for the firing rate of each neuron, um, and we're typically thinking of the neuron carrying the most information or being active at its peak, um, although it's technically active throughout that whole cycle. But so we're really tracking the peaks of these firing rate curves over time. Um, we can also, so this is a high dimensional situation that we can project down. Um, and if we projected onto the first two um, in this sequence, so the eight and the six neurons, right, then we'd actually get this nice cycle of activity, right, and you would stay within this cycle over time. Okay. Um, so another situation that we're modeling typically with limit cycles is also central pattern generators. So these are things for respiration, for example, or for locomotion, right, any type of repetitive movement um, that is sort of unconscious. Um, those are typically found in the spinal cord, um, and those are another sequential situation that we'd model with limit cycles. Okay, so remember, with that linear system that was sort of our first guess of what we might apply, right, we'd only get a single fixed point or an unstable periodic orbit, right? But we really needed all of those other behaviors, and we can get those with a nonlinear system of ODEs, right? And I should also just shout out right now. Um, I was, I'm sort of building everything up for you guys in a way that I could imagine building things up in an undergraduate class. So I apologize if any of these things initially are like obvious review, um, but this is sort of the mentality that I took in this talk. Um, so with nonlinear systems, we can get multi-stability, so the coexistence of multiple stable fixed points. We can also get limit cycles, quasi-periodicity, which I am very loosely defining as sort of an imperfect limit cycle that shifts a bit in time, and we can also get chaotic behavior. And furthermore, all of those can ex coexist in a single network. Okay. So we'd like to move, presumably, to nonlinear, or we need, feel a need to move towards nonlinear network dynamics, assuming that we're going to model this with differential equations. Um, but the question is sort of how complicated of a nonlinearity do we need to get those features? And so can we get them with something that is simple and practically linear? And that's where we turn to threshold linear networks. So the idea here is, here was our linear system before with our leak term plus our synaptic inputs and our external drive, right? Now we're just going to throw on this nonlinearity, this brackets plus, and what that does is if the input to that brackets is negative, then it just is set to zero. And if the input is positive, then the value is just equal to the input. Okay, so we really are, when we're in the positive regime, it really is perfectly linear. When we're in the negative input regime, though, we're set to zero. And so this already has the nice feature that it is more biologically plausible in the sense that um, if you have a starting firing rate vector that's non-negative, then your system will continue to evolve to something non-negative. So you'll never end up with negative firing rates, which wouldn't make sense biologically. Um, additionally, it turns out that this relatively simple nonlinearity is actually enough to get you every type of nonlinear dynamics that you might want. Um, it is a proof of concept, because I can show you networks that do all of those things. Um, but I do, yeah, so I can certainly show you nonlinear networks that have every one of those behaviors. I don't know explicitly of a theorem stating it. 
Um, in particular, much of the study, at least in neural networks of these networks, until the last five years had all been focused on the symmetric case because it was inspired by symmetric hot field networks. And in the symmetric case, you can prove that you actually only get stable fixed points. And so it's not until relatively recently, at least in the neuroscience world, that we're seeing these other phenomena, but yes. Um, and I feel like there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh, incidentally, so we are calling this threshold linear. It's also called rectified linear units um, in the deep learning context, as Jeff alluded to yesterday. And this is actually the become the most popular nonlinearity used there. Um, in deep learning, though, we're, those are restricted to feed-forward networks. So all of your edges are going from one layer to the next. Whereas in our context, we're thinking of living just within a single layer and having connections in, every in any possible direction so that you could end up with loops or cycles in your graph. Um, OK, so again, what's the point of a model like this? Right? Yes, now we can get the behaviors that we're missing before right? and that we want, but what else can this model do for us? And so one idea is to push our understanding of this network so that we can see what network structures, or maybe graph features when we eventually move towards that, but what aspects of the connectivity shape the dynamics. Okay. Um, and from there, right, if we really understood what <laughs> network connectivity produced certain dynamics, then when dynamics are seen experimentally, right, we might have a sense of, oh, this is a connectivity you could go look for. Right? This is structure you might expect to see in your network. Um, and that is a particularly burgeoning field right now. Um, so right, back in 1900, we had this drawing that really, so it was a selective staining of a tiny subset of the neurons. Right? Um, nowadays, so this is out of Jeff Lickman's lab at Harvard around 2013. Um, and this tiny cylinder um, of rat, mouse, brain tissue, they were able to completely image. <laughs> it should be said, though, this cylinder is smaller than a grain of sand. Okay? It's 1,000 micrometer, cubic micrometers. Um, and within it, we already had, what, 680 nerve fibers and 774 synapses. Um, so it is an active area of research to try to recover network connectivity, and this is connectomics in general, um, which has gotten an extra boost as being part of the Obama Brain Initiative. Right? So Be Sebastian Sung had this book on this subject, um, and it's really involving a lot of high-level math in order to try to detect this. Right? But even if we, so one, it might be helpful to know what to look for right? as you're trying to reconstruct this. But two, even if we did know exactly what the connectome was, right? our network connectivity for a particular brain region, right? it begs the question, could we actually predict the resultant dynamics from that? Right? So there is at least one organism now for which we do know the full connectome. Does anyone know what that is? This is a John-inspired question. C. Elegans. C. Elegans. <laughs> yes, so exactly the same answer to John's question yesterday. So for C. Elegans, we know the connectome, but it's still not enough to give us, OK, you're shaking your head that we don't. No. So. No, so what we know is we've mapped out what the synapses are between every pair of neurons, right? We still cannot use that at this point to actually predict, right, when we're going to get chaos or when we're going to get some other type of activity. And so really, the answer is, even if we knew the connectome, right, we still couldn't say exactly what the dynamics would be, right? So there's all of these extra components, complex synapses, 
possible intrinsic neuron dynamics, right? Um, dif lots of different cell types, um, different roles for neuromodulators, dendritic connections versus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, somebody might tell him. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so even if we knew the full connectivity, right, there's so much going on that we still don't know how to predict the dynamics from there, right? But we also still don't know the full connectivity. Um, and so maybe if we better understood in, let's say, a toy model setting, how connectivity could drive dynamics, then we could predict what network structures to look for. Um, and so to tackle these questions, as I mentioned, right, we're actually going to move even closer towards a toy model. Um, and the idea is that we're going to restrict it so much so that we can isolate the role of connectivity alone. Okay? So we're not going to take into account this idea of complex synapses or putting any um, dynamics on our neurons, right, or any intrinsic dynamics to the neurons, or any of these other things, so that we can say, what does connectivity alone produce for us, okay? Are these interesting features that we're seeing in the hippocampus, are they plausible to occur just from the connectivity, or are these other things actually necessary ingredients? Okay, and so in order to make this further restriction to looking at connectivity alone, we introduced um, this combinatorial threshold linear network model. And so we're calling them con combinatorial because they're threshold linear networks that are just sort of defined by a graph. Okay? So the idea is we're taking away this notion of having different weighted edges, and we're going to say that every edge is assigned the same value and every missing edge is also a same assigned value, assigned the same value. Um, and in particular, in this situation, we're actually going to think of modeling within an inhibition-dominated regime. Um, so what that means is, well, I'll, okay. I'll tell you biologically what inspired that in a second, um, but the result of that is that all of these connection strengths are going to be negative. Okay? Um, and so then we're going to need a positive external input to our neurons for them to actually drive. Um, and so we have in this negative regime or this inhibition dominated regime, right, which is sort of representative of a competitive network more generally. Um, so predator-prey models, for example, and I'll give an example of that later. Um, so in this competitive network, if you have an edge, then you're only weakly inhibiting the other neuron. If there is no edge, then there is strong inhibition between them. Okay? And I'll give you a biological model for thinking about that in a second. Um, so with these two values right, that are defined by presence or absence of an edge, we now have our network W, and we've restricted this giant parameter space of all possible threshold linear networks to ones where we just capture the graph and we have these three parameters. Okay, so it's actually closer, at least, to being something that we can tractably understand. Um, Delta is the level, the strength of this stronger inhibition, so this negative 1 minus delta for the strongly inhibitory. Epsilon is the strength of our excitation for the weakly inhibitory, that's negative 1 plus epsilon. Um, and just as a note, that negative 1 is coming from the fact that we set that time constant on the leak term to be 1. Right? So this is all, are you inhibiting more or less than your natural decay to 0? Um, okay, so biological inspiration for this um, is we're thinking of only modeling excitatory cells because that's what we're viewing as carrying information in the system. 
And then what's surrounding all of these excitatory cells, though, are these inhibitory cells shown as gray circles. And the idea is that the purpose of those inhibitory cells at this point, or in this simplified model, is to just dampen all of the activity so you don't get runaway activity. So that means that we're getting sort of global, nonspecific inhibition from these inhibitory cells. So whenever a neuron fires, it makes all the other interneurons or inhibitory neurons around it fire, which then shut up or decrease the firing rate of these other excitatory cells. Okay. But when we have a direct excitatory connection between two cells, that um, attenuates the level of inhibition. So we end up with this weakly inhibitory versus strong inhibition um, context. And I should say, I am not claiming that this is a biologically plausible model of everything. So inhibition domination has been seen in central pattern generators. Um, and there's been some argument by Eusta and others that that may also be relevant to cortex. But really, we're still just looking for a toy model where we can actually explore the role of connectivity alone. And I should say one other thing about the model. We used to have different external inputs, theta i, to every neuron. We have now made those all equal to each other. So the idea is we don't want the external input to be tracking some stimulus that might have inherent dynamics. We want to know, in the absence of any external stimulus, what, gener what internally generated dynamics could we get? Or what emergent dynamics are really coming just as a result of the connectivity of the network itself? OK, so let's start with the boring extremes. Okay, so on the one hand, if we had no edges in our network, um, then every neuron would be strongly inhibiting every other neuron, and we'd end up in this winner-take-all situation. So we'd get n stable fixed points, one, um, one for each of the neurons firing on its own. Um, the other extreme is we have all of the possible edges, so every neuron is just weakly inhibiting every other neuron. And one thing that's maybe non-obvious is that in the presence of weak inhibition, you can still be firing, right? And so here we actually get synchronous behavior where all four nodes are firing, and in fact, they're firing all at the same rate. Um, and so again, we get one stable fixed point. So this is sort of still pretty boring, and the interesting stuff really happens when you get a mix of strong and weak inhibition. Absolutely. It is unstable because there was a positive external drive to all of our neurons. Yep. Yep. OK, so here we have an example network where we have a mix. So I'm showing in this pink um, the strongly inhibitory things, just to remind you that those are there. And then otherwise, we've ne boiled that down to this graph where we're just showing the weakly inhibitory connections. Um, and here is a nice, simple example just on three neurons where we have this cycle. And just to justify sort of why are we showing those weakly inhibitory connections in our graph, well, it turns out the activity of the neurons really does follow those arrows in the graph. So if I initialize, in this case, at neuron one is reaching its peak, then as its firing rate decays, um, it's starting to inhibit less and less neuron 2, and neuron 2 starts to pick up and fire, right? And then again, as that decays, it starts to inhibit neuron 3 less and less, and that picks up and fires. And so we get this sequential firing 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, over and over again. Um, and this is actually a global attractor. So no matter what initial condition you start at, you will get sucked into this limit cycle. Um, so there, though, right, it made sense maybe that the activity was following the arrows because there was sort of only one way that it could go. Um, so what if we have bidirectional arrows? So here, 
um, we have bidirectional arrows between neurons 1 and 2, and we actually end up with a stable fixed point where 1 and 2 are firing, um, and they're in fact firing at the same rate. Um, interestingly though, this is also a global attractor of this network. So even though there is also bidirectional connections between 2 and 3, we never see a stable fixed point where those two neurons are firing together. Um, and we can prove that to be true, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, yeah, so in particular, right, even just all the way back at general threshold linear networks, not just this restricted CTLN case, right, why is it that they can have multiple stable fixed points? Right? What's enabling that? Um, well, it turns out you can have a different fixed point for each possible subset of active neurons. Okay? So we were able to prove my collaborator, Karina Curto at Penn State, and I could prove these were necessary and sufficient conditions in order for a support sigma of, so the collection of active neurons, right, to actually have a stable fixed point there. Um, and this is nice, all well and good. They're still pretty hideous equations to check, though, <laughs> right? And so, but one sort of key point is that just like in the linear case, we can actually solve for the value at that fixed point. And so we get a unique fixed point for each possible support. Um, and support that's actually allowable in this stable condition and with these off neuron conditions. So the idea is we just need to restrict to studying the allowable supports, right? We don't need to care about the actual value of the fixed points themselves, okay? Because those don't carry any additional information. So yes, so this um, condition that I minus W and you take the submatrix with respect to that support tells us whether or not you can have a stable fixed point on that support. Um, and then you still have to check that these conditions are satisfied, in which case the fixed point actually exists there. Yep. So it's sort of two separate things. Do you really have all of the neurons within sigma actually having positive firing rates? And do you actually have that all the other neurons were silent? So does this mean they're, they're going to be like two, two cases have the same support? Correct. And that's because of the linear It's because of the linearity, yeah. The linear portion there. Yep. Yep. And so we can get away with really just focusing on what supports could have a stable fixed point rather than worrying about the values themselves. And that is beautiful in the CTLN condition because it translates really nicely into graph features. Okay. So the one theorem that we proved, and this is in a um, preprint that's on archive now, um, is that given a graph, a click, right, so an all-to-all -all connected subgraph, is the support of a stable fixed point if and only if it is target free. Okay? And target free is a notion that we defined. Um, so it's sort of easier to start out with a negative. So here's a click one, two, three. And in this case, all of the neurons in that click synapse onto neuron four. So neuron four is a target for this click. So it is not target free. Um, over here, they do have outgoing synapses but not all of them synapse onto neuron four, so there is no target, so it's a target-free click. Um, and so it's precisely these target-free clicks that can support stable fixed points. And that's why in that example on the three neurons before, there was one click that could never have a stable fixed point at it, and that's because it had a target. Question? If this connection were not there, it would be target free. Yep, you need every neuron in there to be going to one particular output neuron. Yep. Um, and so right now what this is saying is 
among the subset of clicks, right, the only stable fixed points you can have are when those clicks are target free. We actually conjecture that target free clicks are the only stable fixed points you can have, period, because they are the only ones we have observed so far, um, but we can't prove that at this point. Um, but this proof actually is just a lovely mix of some linear algebra and then just tracing through those um, fixed point equations. So it's actually something that an undergrad could certainly follow. I don't know that you'd want to bother with that, but um, it is um, not terribly difficult. Um, so then the other thing that we were thinking about is, okay, we understand from our fixed point equations and from this condition on when a fixed point can be stable, um, how to get fixed points, right? What if we wanted to rule fix, stable fixed points out completely, right? What if we wanted to guarantee that we weren't in this regime, but instead that we sort of knew we would have limit cycles or chaotic behavior or things like that? And so this potentially, this condition is potentially a little bit overkill if that conjecture were true, but it is enough to guarantee that you have no stable fixed point. So you have a graph that is oriented, so that means that none of the edges are bidirectional. You're always getting at most one edge between two nodes. Um, and there are no sinks. So in other words, all nodes have out degree at least one. Then we can prove that the network has no stable fixed points. Okay. And separately, we can also show that the network always had bounded activity because it was an inhibition-dominated regime. So that means that the dynamics are guaranteed to be oscillatory or chaotic, right? And so this actually, this work of proving or generating a situation where you didn't have stable fixed points was actually the first time that people knew that these network, that threshold linear networks could produce limit cycles and chaos, at least in a large regime. Um, so it had been seen, there was, one paper 10 years ago where they sort of said, no, we don't think this can ever happen. Um, because when you were just randomly searching this huge parameter space, you don't see it. Um, but this was enough to actually allow us to generate a lot of examples where we do see it. Um, and then, so just some example-oriented graphs with no sinks. So here's a nice simple one of a four cycle. Here's a much more complicated one. This one is actually a tournament so that between every pair of nodes, there is exactly one edge. Um, but we didn't need to go this far, right? We could have missing edges and still be in this situation. The graph just needed to be or oriented. OK, so let's see, right, what all can we get with these combinatorial threshold linear networks, right? And remember, so in all of these cases that I'm going to show you, we actually fixed epsilon and delta. So those are not changing anywhere. And we fixed theta to be 1. Okay? So the only thing that is changing is the graph itself, right? so the network connectivity. And so connectivity alone is enough to generate an incredible number of behaviors. And we really didn't know that before. So when people had typically been trying to get limit cycles in their network models, they were often introducing sort of intrinsically oscillating neurons, right? So they thought that they needed this added ingredient, ingredient of rhythmicity in the neurons themselves in order to see these rhythmic sequences. Um, but it turns out you don't, right? Connectivity alone is enough to do it for you. So here's one connectivity matrix. Um, so it's just an adjacency matrix with ones where there are edges. Um, and... Uh, here we're getting a limit cycle, right? Here is another random connectivity matrix, and we're getting chaos. And here is a connectivity matrix that has very nice, sort of ridiculously idealized structure. Um, but it's enough to show us that we can actually get this quasi-periodic behavior. So it's like this sort of drifting limit cycle that's actually filling out a torus. Um, I should also maybe walk back a second from what I said before. Um, 
I should not say that all models resorted to rhythmic neurons or anything in order to implement things. That was just a common implementation for central pattern generator models before and things like that. Um, but this shows you really could do it without resorting to something like that. Um, furthermore, you can actually get all of these behaviors coexisting in a single network. Um, so in this case, we're as small as just eight neurons, and that's enough to get us two stable fixed points a limit cycle, and a chaotic attractor. Okay. Um, and this is actually a period doubled limit cycle in this case, and that's how you're seeing that loop inside of itself on that projection, or that sort of double loop. Um, we can also get multiple attractors of the same type within a network. So this is our baby chaos example. Um, so on just five neurons alone, um, we actually get four different chaotic attractors. And the idea is you're getting a chaotic attractor for each one of these um, symmetric and overlapping three cycles. And just to dis identify, I should say, we cannot prove that these are chaotic in a theoretical sense. That is typically hard. Um, so like the Lorenz attractor was known for... I don't know, something like almost 100 years before you could actually prove it was chaotic. But we can do numerical exper experiments where you perturb your initial condition by literally the smallest value that eps um, epsilon that um, MATLAB will recognize. And the pinching points occur at different times. Right? So we really are coming in along some stable direction towards a fixed point where all those neurons are firing synchronously. And then we spiral out from that unstable fixed point, um, and it's at unpredictable times. Yeah? No, sorry. It is not the epsilon and delta of our model. It is, MATLAB has a number eps that's like 10 to the negative 16 that I can add to my initial condition. So all that I'm changing here is the initial condition. I am not changing the epsilon of the... I am not changing the weights. So what allowed me to get, so going back to, yeah, so, yeah, it's the smallest number. So I am not changing this epsilon here, right? What happens is I have these um, dynamics, but I needed some initial condition that I was starting at. And what I am saying is I am changing that initial condition by the smallest possible amount that MATLAB will let me. And I am getting, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um. Yes, exactly. So they are for four different initial conditions. Um, for this one, right, we initialized with one, two, and oh, that didn't have a label anymore, five firing, um, and we ended up in this chaotic attractor. For this one, we initialize at three, four, and five firing, and we end up in a different chaotic attractor. But the way that we know that they're chaotic is that we just perturb that initial condition a tiny bit, and the timing of these pinches and um, cycling out changes. So it, there's unpredictability there of that chaotic attractor. OK. Um, so another interesting thing, right? We had this idea that the activity was following arrows. But in a more complex graph, right, how do you pick out what arrows it's following? Um, so in this particular example, which again is a tournament, um, but it's oriented with no sinks, so we know we're getting oscillatory or chaotic behavior. Um, we actually get a global attractor. So every initial condition that we begin at takes us to this same sequence. And in this sequence, right, we're following this particular um, cycle that's shown in black. Um, and it's really just, there's nothing different about those edges. I just showed them in black versus gray to highlight which cycle we're following. Um, but this is really unpredictable from local graph features, right? 
So for example, if I just thought about, oh, neurons with a high end degree should be more likely to fire, right? I would think neuron two with an end degree of three should be firing. But in this global attractor sequence, it actually dies almost immediately, okay? Whereas neuron three, um, which only receives two synaptic inputs, stays alive and actually has a pretty high peak, okay? So these sequences really are somehow emergent from the full graph connectivity, and they are not just a result of um, local structures alone or local statistics alone. Not in this case. In this case, no matter what initial condition I started at, I got this same limit cycle. So here it was a global attractor. In the other ones where I showed multiple things in one network, initial conditions are absolutely essential to determining which attractor you're going to go to. But this is a global attractor. So for all initial conditions, you go there. Um, okay, so challenge problem, right? What's special about this particular cycle? Um, and if there is time, we may discuss it a little bit later in this talk, and then otherwise we could discuss it in some of the activities. Um, and just to tie it back to some biological motivation, so as I mentioned, my collaborator has been working with Eva Pastalkova at Janelia for a while now, and so I've gotten tied into that. Um, and she has given us some example data of ripple sequences in hippocampus. So these are, this is sequential neuron firing in the absence of external inputs, right? So this really is sort of the same idea of this is not being modulated by the stimulus, but is somehow emerging from the connectivity itself in the same way as if we interpreted these peaks as being firing points in time, we'd be seeing this sequential activity that's somehow shaped by the connectivity alone. Um, other things that we can observe, so there are also networks that give us quasi-synchronous firing, so we don't always get just perfect sequences. So here, these three neurons all fire or reach their peaks at about the same time. Um, we can also get perfectly synchronous. Um, so in this case, you can't tell because they're plotted directly on top of each other, but two, three, and five are actually all firing synchronously together at the bottom here. Um, and one cool thing is where that's coming from. Um, so the idea is if I redrew the graph that I just had, it turns out that neuron four feeds on to these three interior neurons, which then all feed on to this last one, which <laughs> loops back around. And so that means I have this cycle in here of neurons that are all, in some sense, equivalent to each other, right? So I'm getting this graph symmetry of this cycle 2, 5, 3, and that symmetry is exactly what is resulting in that synchronous firing. Um, and so this is something also that we could come back and talk, to in the, talk about in the activities. Um, and then just an interesting tie-in. So we had already been looking at this graph um, and had it drawn in this form coincidentally. Um, and we stumbled upon this PNAS paper um, that was about a predator-prey model for species diversity. And so this was a competitive network, which is the exact same idea as this inhibition-dominated regime. In their case, they were not using differential equations or anything. It was purely a discrete model, and their update rule at each time step was you have some big population here, this, er, this population is preyed upon by this one, and so one thing from here will be eliminated while another thing from here will be added. So they're just sort of swapping population elements at each time step, um, but that was sort of computationally impossible for the majority of the examples, and so they moved to other methods and couldn't really simulate it. Um, but as it turns out, the CTLN model phenomenologically produces exactly the same results. Okay. 
Um, so while we were sort of neurally inspired initially, this really is more broadly applicable when you care mostly about the phenomenological understanding um, of what's going on in competitive networks. Um, so what else can we do with this stuff, right? If we really have an understanding, or at least a partial understanding, of stable um, fixed points and limit cycles, right, we can put that knowledge together to engineer networks with a particular prescribed set of dynamic patterns. And throughout the following, what we're going to really be using is sort of this implicit assumption in the conjecture that we get a stable fixed point if and only if we have a target-free click. Um, so here, this was a central pattern generator example where we're thinking about um, quadruped gates or locomotion. So in a bound, you get the front legs going and then the hind legs going together and then the front together and the hind together. I'm really not going to act it out because <laughs> that'll be interesting on a live stream. Um, but And then we also have a gate of a trot where you have the right front left four and then the left front um, right hind um, going together in that sequence. And so um, we had just been looking at this dynamical systems book as Karina was teaching this math neuro class at um, Penn State while I was visiting her. And the model that they had for implementing this involved coupled oscillators, so intrinsically rhythmic neurons, right? And you actually had to change parameters in to get between these two different gates. Um, and it was surprisingly complicated and sort of over the top. But it turns out, using the theorem um, and then the conjecture, we can actually easily implement this with our network, right? We want these two hind legs to um, fire together, right? So we put a click between them. But we don't want to stabilize there, so we send it to a target, right? And then the target takes us to the other pair of legs going together. Right? And then we come back to this. And we have exactly the same setup for the left four and the right hind and the right four and the left hind to get the trot. Okay? And so just changing initial conditions is enough to get us both of those behaviors without any other parameter changes. Bless you. Um, so another thing that people have modeled in neural networks often is the sinfire chain where you're getting a collection of neurons firing and then the next collection fires and so on. And we just wanted to show sort of a, a proof of concept that we could do that here as well. And this really is just an application, again, of the target free clicks. Um, here is another case that was hippocampally inspired um, with this idea of tracking a rat's position in space, where we just glued together different graph modules, but again could get this chain. Um, and then the other key idea, though, was this networks with symmetry where we saw that synchronous firing before. And really the takeaway about networks with symmetry is that if you have a symmetry acting on the graph, that symmetry has to also act on the space of attractors. Right? And so you either have a case, so here we have symmetry neurons 3 and 4 have identical um, incoming neighborhoods and identical outgoing neighborhoods, right? So we have this perfect symmetry between them. So we see one attractor where neuron 3 is strongly firing, and then we see the mirror of it where neuron 4 is strongly firing. Um, and we also, in this case, see an attractor where they're both firing together synchronously. Oh, I should not have said attractor. This one is not stable under this set of parameters. Um, but interestingly, this is the qualitative behavior changes with epsilon and delta, not the qualitative. <laughs> um, the stability changes with epsilon and delta. So when we change those, this will actually become a stable limit cycle. Um, and also, this can reduce from being period doubled to just the straight sequence 1, 2, 4, or the other straight sequence 1, 2, 3. Um, and so again, right, the set of attractors must respect the symmetries of the graph. 
Um, and so as soon as we see this one, we know that one has to be there as well. Um, here's another case where we just exploited symmetry. Um, and we put all of these neurons together in a middle layer. And then we had top ones that connected to them all. And they all connected to a bottom one, which fed back. Um, so this is the same structure as that um, one on five neurons that was in the predator prey paper. And here it turns out you'll get um, an attractor for every three cycle that involves those two outer neurons. Um, but they actually are not perfect limit cycles. They're quasi-periodic. Um, so this is a case where we can get n minus two quasi-periodic attractors coexisting. And here, just um, we did this as sort of a fun capacity argument. right? How many limit cycles could we guarantee that we could have in a network? Um, so here we made a complete directed multipartite graph. So within each part, all of the neurons are um, adjacent to all of the neurons in the next layer, and so on moving forward with the last one looping around. Um, and then as soon as we know that we have one attractor that picks out one neuron from each layer, we know that we have every single other possible five node sequence uh, as another attractor. And so with in this case, it's five because we chose to make it five layers. Um, with five layers and m neurons per layer, so a total of five m neurons, we can get m to the fifth limit cycles. Right? So we're actually getting polynomial capacity here, um, which is cheating a little because of all of the symmetry that's not totally realistic. Um, but it is sort of an idea, an upper bound in some sense. Well, not even but one estimate of how big your capacity could be. Um, and just really quickly, going back to that, like two slides left, um, going back to that one crazy oriented graph example um, where we couldn't understand the cycle that got picked out, um, there is a grad student of my collaborator, um, Caitlin Parmalee, who's been working on when we restrict to the case where we know we're getting oscillatory or chaotic dynamics, can we predict the sequential activity? Um, so here was that crazy example again. And um, she has designed one algorithm for prediction that is pretty effective so far. Um, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by pretty effective in a minute. Um, but certainly there is room for improvement. Um, but so what she did is she's thinking about deconstructing the graph down to some core cycle by removing nodes repeatedly and then going from that core cycle and building it back up by inserting the missing nodes intelligently. Um, so at each step, she's removing the vertex with the smallest in degree, um, and then she's going to build things back up. And so just to walk you through an example, in this graph here, vertex 1 had n degree 1. And so she removed that and got to this, where vertex 3 had n degree 1. And she removed that and got down to a core cycle. Ooh, I forgot the other important component. You can only remove a vertex if it does not create a sink in your subgraph, OK? Because um, otherwise, you'd introduce a fixed point. Um, and so. Once we've gotten down here, there's nothing left we can remove without creating a sink. And so that's our core cycle, or the core sequence 254. And those are going to be the high-firing neurons in our sequence. And then we'll add back in the deleted nodes into the sequence based on where they received from the core cycle. So here, neuron 3 received from neuron 2 in the core cycle, so it gets reinserted right after that. Here, neuron 1 only receives from neuron 3, which was not one of those high-firing neurons because it wasn't part of the core cycle. So it actually doesn't get reinserted. Um, and this does accurately predict um, the limit cycle that we see here. There were choices at the first step of whether we delete node 1 or delete node 3. And you should follow those choices. In this case, deleting no node 3 still reduces us down first 
still reduces us down to the same core cycle and we'd predict exactly the same sequence. But other times we might get a different sequence, which is often represented, um, representative of there being another limit cycle. Um, so she amazingly um, recorded all 160 graphs on n less than or equal to 5, so at most 5 neurons, that are oriented and have no sinks. So this is 160 up to permutation equivalence. Um, and the algorithm correctly predicts the observed sequences in 142 of that 160 cases. Um, but we already know from trying to move up to n equals 6, for which, by the way, um, Sage dies when you try to ask it to print out for you all of the inequivalent um, oriented graphs with no sinks. So there is an incredible number of those. But we already know from looking at some things there that she doesn't have enough rules for how to reinsert to handle these larger cases. So the algorithm definitely could, would not do as well moving forward. And so there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and I've had some undergrads working with me for this last year on this stuff. And um, their next step is going to be to look more at this algorithm and try to understand things more. So this is very nicely accessible. Um, so just to wrap things up, thank you for your attention. And I want to thank um, my collaborator, Karina Curto, at Penn State, her grad student, Caitlin Parmalee, and then our other collaborators, Andrzej Dratu and Vladimir Itzkoff and then Eva Pistakova for consulting with us about um, biological plausibility of things and uh, things we should be looking for our networks to be able to model. So, thank you. Yeah. Your um, different types of um, configurations that generate the complex patterns uh -huh. at different conditions. So how low, so I think an interesting question is how low can you go in terms of your model dimension, how many nodes, and still get those complex patterns? So we have... Um, can you do it with two? No. So okay. in Good. particular... Three? Yes. Well, let's... Okay. <laughs> So there is exactly <laughs> one oriented I graph with no sinks on three neurons, mm -hmm. and that is the three cycle, right? And so in the case where we can prove there are no stable fixed points, there is only one thing that can happen on n equals three, and that's that you just get this perfect limit cycle there. Okay. Um, as soon as you go to four, you can get multiple limit cycles, and within the same network, when we're still just thinking about this oriented graph case, um, we haven't explored more generally than that. And then as soon as you go to five, you can get chaos. And you can get multiple what, chaos. What about effects. if responses are nonlinear? So yours is kind of you know, flat linear, right. but it's nonlinear, as well as if it's, uh, you put some. I think you can probably do a lot with three if you put nonlinearity in. Potentially. I would um, predict with kind a of. Even different nonlinearity, we could not prove what sure. graph structures we have to look sure. for. Yeah. Um, so you certainly may be able to get, um, yeah, so in some of these models, so right, they often just do a whole population of excitatory neurons is one node, and a whole population of inhibitory neurons is another node, and with that model, you can get dynamics just with two nodes alone, um, which we can't, but really they're sort of thinking of all these hidden... So so yeah. then fundamental question, so why do we need to go more than like four nodes or five? If you say, let's say five can give us complicated dynamics, so why do we need to go more than that? Um, Just because it's fun? Mm, no, so I mean, and we play so far have restricted really to just looking at five and less for initial predictions on things. Um, but... One sort of motivation is if someone handed you a connectivity, which I'm not thinking about getting handed a whole connectome, right? But if someone handed me some connectivity, could I use what I understood from those smaller cases in order to predict what's going on in that larger case? And sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. Oh, 
oh, so that was if I were trying to model exactly what were going on in the brain, where I had complex synapses and everything beyond that. Then I definitely cannot. Um, but in this restricted CTLN case, right, give me a larger graph, and I can look for certain substructures and potentially understand what's going to happen in that larger graph. Um, so then that's one of those boring extremes that I showed where you get synchronous behavior where all three of those nodes fire um, at the same firing rate. Um, Vitaly, I want to go back to your question for one more second, though, because I just remembered now that we're staring at this slide. Um, there's actually a nature paper where they proved that in order to get multiple um, quadruped gates in the same network, based on symmetry considerations, you actually needed a minimum of eight neurons to do it, right? So that is a case where we did need to move larger in order to actually be able to implement it. Um, and our particular example uses eight neurons, but it doesn't get all of the full set of gates, or we haven't tried to get the full set of gates that they described in that paper. Um, but so that was a case where being that in that smaller context alone could not work, and this was model independent. This was solely based on symmetry considerations. Yes. The synchronous behavior. That we do not have a proof that we definitely have something with synchrony, um, but we can state that that symmetry or that automorphism on that subgraph has to act on the set of attractors. So it could act on it either by having a single attractor where everything gets interchanged according to that automorphism or by having multiple attractors where you get. And in fact, we've seen symmetric or graphs that have symmetries, right? So this one graph, right, this was not a stable attractor. So if I think about things acting on the set of attractors, it's just acting here. I'm not guaranteed a stable attractor with synchrony. So it doesn't depend on what's the rest of the connection in the graph. It does not. It does not. The automorphism on just a subgraph alone is enough to say that that automorphism has to act on the space of attractors. It's an automorphism of the whole graph. It's an automorphism of the whole graph. I was just, yeah, no, you're not. You're not. Um, thank you, by the way, for this great talk. You must have put a lot of time into it. <laughs> All right, so my question is related to the very first slide that I, I was uh, even slower than her in coming up with my question. <laughs> so uh, um, so in the um, these uh, connection strengths, yes. uh, those W, the, the weights, yep. so um, so they are optim so they are determined right for to 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 come up with an optimal model uh, or to so to explain the scenario that that if we were trying to perfectly match right. the network dynamics then we would try to find values of for, w right. that match so my question is do you know of any study where those uh, connection strengths are stochastic In, for instance, a node, let's say, f for instance, like in Alzheimer's, right? right. Some, some nodes, some, sometimes they fire, sometimes they fail to fire. Yes. But those are at random times. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I certainly know of models where they have made sort of the result of the dynamics stochastic in the sense that there is noise um, added at the node itself, or sort of what happens in the node itself. In this case, we are not tracking that exactly. We're sort of averaging out over that noise by tracking the firing rate instead. 